Uh, hi, so thanks for coming. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Gom here. He's a young ambassador for climate uh, in the French delegation that goes to uh, climate uh, negotiation events. I'm not sure of the name in English actually. Uh, and he also co founded uh, a non profit called JAC, which uh, stands for Jeune Ambassador for, uh, for le Climat. Uh, so in English, it's uh, Young Ambassadors for Climate. And uh, the idea is to spread uh, the message of what we can do, what the current situation, basically what we're going to hear today uh, to young people all over France uh, and also to uh, the starting now um, enterprises, I guess. And so he's going to talk to us about the current status of the climate change and the climate in general. Uh, then he's going to talk about um, the, uh, the negotiations, what uh, countries try to do, and lastly, what we as individual people can do uh, at different levels. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, okay, this is the beginning of my presentation, and I will start with very, very basic things. So I am sorry uh, in advance if you all know this. I will try to, to be fast on the, the part about the scientific diagnosis. Um, these are the last outputs of the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mainly. So first of all, what is the origin of climate change? Max, uh, Mark Twain once said that um, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we know for sure that ain't so. And for climate change, we are a bit in this situation. First, we can consider the emissions of carbon dioxide in terms of um, uh, fossil fuels uh, emissions. And we often have the feeling that our emissions mainly come from oil. It is false. The first source of emissions today is coal, with more than 40%. The reason for that is just that the United States uh, started to massively tap shale oil and uh, exported coal uh, all over the world. So the price of coal just decreased. And now uh, it's the first source of energy in India, China, and Indonesia. Another way to consider the emissions, um, it's uh, here, it's in France, it's to see the different emissions per gas. You know, there are different kinds of uh, greenhouse gas. There's methane, nitrous oxide, and carbon dioxide. We often have the feeling that there's only carbon dioxide. It's false. There's a big part of greenhouse gases that are emitted by agriculture. And here you can see on the left that it's a very big part uh, of it. Here on the left, you have the emissions in 1990 and on the right in 2016. We have the feeling that our emissions of greenhouse gases decreased. It is totally false. You will understand why here. Here in red, you have the emissions in France. But these are the emissions of production between 1995 and 2015. We have the feeling that these emissions decreased. These are official statistics. But in gray, it's the emissions that are linked to our carbon footprint, which means our emissions of consumption. And you, you can see that there are big differences. First, our carbon footprint is way higher than the emissions of production, and they are not really decreasing. It is a massive problem. So all the statistics you can find in the newspaper, at TV, about the French, um, uh, you know, uh, emitted by the French Ministry of the Environment, for example, is based on the emissions of production. It's in red. And everybody says, OK, in France, our emissions are decreasing. It is false. It is false because the real important emissions are the emissions of um, consumption, which is the carbon footprint. OK, and the last. Um, angle to study the, the emissions, it's the emissions per country. And here again, we often have the feeling that China is the biggest emitter in the world since uh, decades. Again, it's false. Here you have the emissions starting in uh, 1850. It's the, called the pre-industrial era. And we see that European countries and the United States were the first emitter since decades. And China, 
it's only in the 1990s that China really raised and became the first emitting country. I show you this because in the climate negotiations, we often talk about a common but differentiated responsibility. Countries have not emitted the same way in time and do not emit the same way at present. And this is very important to understand um, the, the way uh, climate negotiations are uh, tackled. Okay, this is about the origin of emissions. Now let's see the impact. Okay, I didn't put his name, but I know you, you all know him now. He once said that the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturers non-competitive. Okay, so I just wanted to check. So first, let's see the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Al Gore in uh, 2006 showed this same graph. And now I just updated and I added like 10 years. Here is the concentration in PPM, parts per million, since 800,000 years. Okay, so you see that in 60 years, roughly, the concentration almost doubled because of our activity. Obviously, this has an enormous impact on the temperature. Here is uh, temperature measures since the pre-industrial era again. And the IPCC, so the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which gathers all the scientific working on climate science, proved that since 1850 here, the temperature raised in average of 0 0.9 degree. Yet, when we talk about temperature raise, we often have the feeling that it is um, the same, uh, the same level of phrase everywhere. It's totally false. Some parties of the world will get way colder and some other parties in the world will get much warmer than two degrees. Here you have an evolution of the average temperature on five years. And you will see that the temperature rise is not the same everywhere. It's quite striking to see that here in the Southern Pole, the temperature average decreased a lot of an average of two degrees, while the northern part of the uh, globe increased by more than two degrees. So when we talk about an average raise of two degrees, it doesn't mean anything. The two degrees principle is a diplomatic concept. It's a tool used by scientists and diplomats to negotiate on a target of emissions, but it's nothing more. Okay. Obviously, um, this temperature raise has an impact on the sea level. Yet we often say a lot of bullshit about it because the sea level is very, uh, you know, um, impressive. We have the feeling that we, we will uh, experience multimeters uh, rise of the ocean. It's not really the case. Until now, the sea level raised by 20 centimeters and the middle scenarios of the IPCC are at around 70 centimeters from now. So it's a lot. You can see here, for example, the consequences of this raise um, in like 50 years in Netherlands. Okay, there's a big difference. And this is the middle scenario. So we are on a trajectory that is that one. If, if states don't increase their ambition, we will have this state at the end of this century. Yet, the IPCC proves us another thing, which is that if the average temperature um, goes beyond two degrees compared to now, we could start to melt the Greenland and the Antarctic marine ice shelf. Sh uh, marine ice uh, shelf. Well, you understand, I guess. Uh, and uh, this could, uh, this could uh, start a very long process which could uh, imply multimeters uh, rise again. But the time frame for this is more like two or three centuries. So in 200, in 2300, we, we could experience this kind of thing here in Bangladesh, here in New York. This is in maybe two centuries, something like that. And again, Northern Europe, something like that. 
So we will expect big changes, but again, this is long time frame. It's not what we will experience uh, in our lives. Okay, the last thing is that the global um, uh, acidity, uh, pH of the ocean is also uh, increasing, the acidity, and this destroys the coral reefs. And at the current trajectory, again, if states are not more ambitious than what they are now, Nine, more than 99% of coral reefs will be destroyed at the end of the century. I don't know if you realize what it means, but coral reefs are not just cool things, uh, beautiful things uh, with uh, marvelous colors. Coral reefs are really the nursery of, uh, of the marine biodiversity. In coral reefs, many fish like just born, I don't know how we say, well, they take life in the coral reefs. So if we destroy this, we destroy full ecosystems in the maritime, uh, in the oceans. So this acidification uh, of the ocean is probably the biggest threat we have today. And it's obviously linked to uh, climate change. Now, I often like to, to do this little game because in the media, we often hear, again, bullshit about that. What is the human influence on extreme weather events? First, on the heavy rains, on the heavy rains frequency, okay we do have a high influence on this. On the intensity of heavy rains, we have a medium intensity. On the flood frequency, again. On the hurricane's intensity, we have a high influence. Yet, on the hurricane's frequency, you can often hear on CNN on B or BFM TV or these kind of channels, that, oh, the frequency of hurricanes is increasing because of climate change. This is totally false there is really low confidence on the fact that humans have an influence on uh, the frequency of hurricanes. Okay, when we talk about climate change, we also talk about the consequences on uh, humans, climate migrants. The World Bank estimates that 140 million climate migrants by 2050. This could be frightening in a way, because these are enormous figures. Yet, uh, you have to understand that m most of these climate refugees will be internal. This number is only internal climate refugees. It only means that they will have to move within their countries. Well, it's, it's dramatic because they have to totally change their, um, their behaviors. They have to change and build new homes, etc. But yet, we at the international level will never see them. It will be internal. That is why it's uh, becoming a very um, important uh, issue. And about climate refugees, I'm sure all of you have already heard this, climate refugees, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, it is, a totally, it is a total nonsense. Because to be a refugee, you have to, to experience a well-founded fear of um, persecution for motive of race, religion, nationality, uh, political opinion, and membership to a particular social group. Climate is not in these five blocks. So the notion of climate refugees is not defined in the 1951 uh, Convention on, of Geneva on climate refugees. You cannot have the status of refugee if you are a climate migrant. And it's a big, it's a big problem. The last thing is biodiversity. We took decades, it took decades to link the biodiversity to climate change. Yet, climate change is the fifth cause of threat to biodiversity. To give you an example, well, an idea of the numbers, more than uh, 1,600 species are affected by climate change and 80% of insects and 60% of plants will lose more than 50% of their natural habit because of climate change. I'm sorry, I know there's a lot of figures here. It's just after lunch. It will maybe take time to get all these figures, but it basically means that because of climate change, a significant part of the species we know now will have to move and to migrate. So it's not only a question of human migration, it's also a question of um, biodiversity uh, migration. Okay, now let's come to the topic of this day. It's the negotiations. Obviously, you understood there's a big problem. I know that 
if you are here today, is that you are maybe aware of the problem already. So maybe you didn't learn so many things until now. But I hope you will learn new things now. Here it's uh, a quote from Christiana Figueres. She was the secretary executive of uh, the United Nations uh, Framework on Climate Change. I will explain a bit later what it is. And she said that you don't run a, mar a marathon with one step. OK, this is rather basic, but OK. And she was right, because it took maybe 15 years, 50 years to set up a clear, stable framework to tackle the question of climate change. It all started in 1972. I'm sure you all heard about the Stockholm Conference. It was the birth of uh, the UNEP, United Nations Environmental Programme. And at this time, states said that, OK, you know what? Pro uh, there's a bigger uh, problem with the environment. We have pollution, etc. Let's meet every 10 years to just you know, solve the issue. Every 10 years. Well, useless to say that they increased the frequency of the meeting afterwards. Then the Geneva Climate Conference. It's a scientific conference. After the politicians said, OK, we should tackle the question of climate change, scientists said, OK, maybe we, sh we, we have a role in this. So they first met in Geneva in 1979. And then they created the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. I will repeat this name uh, many times, because it is the, really the reference of the scientific knowledge about climate. And the IPCC said in its first report, OK, there's a huge, huge problem with climate change in 1988. It's the beginning of the universal consciousness in the scientific world about the urgency to tackle climate change issue. So the politician again came at the table of negotiations and created the UNFCCC, United Nations Convention of, on Climate Change. And here it's the birth of COPs. You all know about COP, COP21, COP24, maybe in Katowice, you heard about it. And everything started here in 1992. They set up a first protocol in 1997. The Kyoto Protocol logic was to say, OK, climate change is a big issue. We have to reduce our emissions by 5% in 10 years. The state gathered around the table and they said, OK, you, you will reduce by 5%. You, you will re reduce by 10%. What happened? Obviously, state just disengaged and, and left the agreement because it was too binding for them. That's why we came to the Paris Agreement, where the logic is totally the opposite. We don't say we need to reduce by 5% here. How we, here is how we will share the efforts. In the Paris Agreement, states don't have any uh, binding thing at the beginning. They just arrive at the table and say, OK, I will reduce my emissions by 5% in 10 years. And China said, OK, I will, well, I will not reduce my emissions, and et cetera, et cetera. Yet, there is one condition. In time, they have to be always more ambition. And even if they start from zero, they have to be or stable in ambition or higher ambition. It is the core principle of the Paris Agreement, and it enabled to make it totally universal. As we saw, the United States, uh, well, broke a bit this uh, idea, but globally until now, it's more than nine, uh, 100, 900, 190 countries. So it's a rather universal thing. OK, about the negotiations item, I will try to be fast on it because it's a bit uh, the trickiest part of the conferences because it's, there's uh, many details about it. First, about finance. It's a core issue in the climate negotiations because it's, it costs a lot of money to make the transition. So countries decided that the northern country would transfer $100 billion by 2020 uh, to 1,000 countries to help them do their transition. But when you have said that, you have said, you have said nothing. Just because the accounting of this money is very difficult. When you give money to someone, you can give it in euro, in dollar, you can give it as a loan, as a donation. And how do you count the money? So countries had to set up a common metric to evaluate the financial transfer. So this was achieved during the COP24. Yet, on the financial volumes, they didn't manage to find an agreement. About the reporting, it's the same question. 
When you say, OK, I will reduce my emissions by 10% in 20 years, it doesn't mean anything. You have to define a common harmonized metric at the scale of the world. And this is what was the topic of the COP24. And OK, states managed to find common metrics, yet they put a bit of flexibility, but I will not go into deep details. Just remember that, OK, about finance and reporting, it's OK. We managed to find common metrics at the scale of the world, which is not obvious. It took 24 years to arrive at this uh, result. About science, this is the biggest failure of the COPs until now. COPs, yes, sorry, it's Conference of Parties. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, about science, every four or five years, the IPCC publishes a scientific report about the, the status, uh, the state of the climate uh, on Earth. And the idea is that the states, the governments gathering in these COPs, uh, have to approve the results of science. And they do this regularly. And here at the COP24, because of Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, United States, and Russia, the last results of science, which are obviously dramatic, were just refused. About mechanisms also, uh, mechanisms are very useful for a country to buy emission reductions in other countries, in other parts of the world. For example, if you are an American investor, you can invest money in a Brazilian forest to import emissions, to import em emission reductions, sorry. You will pay a certain amount and it will count it for you. Yet, because of Brazil, this negotiation item was a total fail because Brazil wanted that if this American investor put some money in Brazil to reduce emissions counted for the United States, Brazil said, OK, that works for me, but I also want these emissions to be counted for me. In other words, it's called double counting. And if you do this, there's an enormous problem at the scale of the world, because you said that you reduce your emission by 15%, but in fact, it's only half, it's only 7%. So it was, again, a big fail. And also, there are two last negotiations items which were quite uh, good, uh, quite effective. We found agreements on this. It's about education, gender, indigenous people, all these items are about the integration of women, of um, young people, of uh, indigenous people and local communities. And these ideas of inclusiveness of the climate negotiations also took decades, but now it's okay. These people are integrated. We, if you have questions about it, I'd be happy to answer at the end because it's a very tricky issue also. Yet, if you read between the lines, the big fail also of the COP24 was the lack of ambition. All the international communities of NGOs, observers, journalists expected that, okay, we would, the countries would raise their ambition in the face of the last result of the science, showing the, you know, the dramatic uh, things I just showed you before. Everybody expected that the states would raise their ambition. It was a total failure because no state just said that, okay, I will engage for more. And also about the economic model, we never talk about that. And it's a big problem because we all know that the origin of these emissions is the way we produce, the way we consume. And this is never, ever tackled in the climate negotiations. In climate negotiations, we just talk about accounting, finance, and um, inclusion of everybody. So the question is, I don't know if you know him, Antonio Guterres, the UN uh, Secretary Executive, is, are COP useful? It's often a question we have in conference, are COPs useful? The answer is yes, they are, but we expect too much from them. They are because we need something that coordinates all the countries, that shows that everybody is motivated to try and start to reduce its emissions. And also, uh, also it puts a big uh, media, uh, it's a big publicity, you know, for, for, uh, for states uh, at this, uh, at this moment, yet, we cannot expect more from this. The core of the efforts will be done at the national level and the subnational level. So let's see how we do this at the level of Europe. Laurence Tobiana was the um, French ambassador at COP21, 
uh, aside François Hollande and uh, Ségolène Royal. And she was a bit the thinker of the way COP21 uh, was, um, was built. And she said Paris will not solve all, of course. Again, it's very simple, I know. But she was right. Because all what we have to do, it's now. The COP process is almost over, almost. Now we have to, OK, do uh, efforts at the level of the European Union. So what are the objectives? By 2030, European uh, Union set objectives in three different areas. Emission, greenhouse gas emission reduction, uh, final energy consumption, and share of renewable energies. You are all familiar with these concepts, I guess. Yeah, a bit. In greenhouse gas emission, we took the engagement to reduce them by 40% compared to 1990. It's enormous, and we are very far from it yet. In terms of final energy consumption, it's minus 20% compared to 2012. And in terms of share of renewable energies, it's 32%. What about France? France could have been more ambitious. You know, European uh, Union sets uh, the ground of objectives, and then countries are allowed to go higher. Well, France decided to, well, keep the same, the same level of ambition. Yet, in France, we are very good to set long-term, incredible objectives. Cocorico a bit. And so for 2050, you know where everybody will be uh, in other countries as well. OK, here it's minus 95%. It's called climate neutrality. We don't emit more than we consume. Very, very uh, uh, ambitious. And it's good to say that, you know, when you are Minister of the Environment, yeah, climate neutrality in how many years? 30, OK, great. And same for the final energy consumption, minus 50%. I want you to remember that it's not only about greenhouse gas reduction. The ecological transition, it's also a question of decrease of energy consumption. So let's try to see how we manage to to fulfill this objective. Here you find the final energy consumption in France. And in red, it's the objective. And in gray, it's the real trajectory. And you see that we are very, very far from it. And in France, we love this. You know, We set a beautiful objective. And then here it's our current trajectory. It's always like that, you know, like a, a beak a bit. And we find this everywhere. If you take, for example, the transport emission, the same. Since 2012, our transport emissions just increased. And we set objective of decrease, but OK, it didn't change anything. Why that? Because we buy bigger cars, more powerful cars, and heavier cars. And again, in the, the building emissions, oh, we have very beautiful objectives, yes. The problem is that, well, the trajectory is, OK, sorry, it's not good to say that here, but the trajectory is the total opposite. And we really have this problem uh, in every sector in France. Uh, and it reminds me of Oscar Wilde. Ambition is the last refuge of the failure. Until now, the climate ambition of France is very good, and we have no problem about it. But it's hard to fulfill it. OK, I think I'm, I'm done. So if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. You think about personal carbon offsets for flights, for example? About carbon offsets? Yeah, so if I buy my own carbon offsets, yeah. is, that, is that a good thing already, or is that also not sustainable in the long term? It's a really good thing to compensate, um, because currently uh, the good news is that we destroyed our forest since decades. So now we can plant them again. So, and in, in doing this, you store carbon in, um, in the soil and in the trees themselves. But uh, in five years or in 10 years in France, if we continue to uh, plant forest, we will reach a threshold. And a normal forest that is mature, that is uh, you know, uh, living its normal cycle, doesn't, stock, do doesn't store any carbon. Because the trees die. In dying, OK, they, they, there's moisture. A great part of the carbon is remitted. The, the rest goes in the soil. 
but then in average the the forest will never store carbon anymore but again if you do this now if now you take plane and try to compensate it's a good thing because many forests in the world got totally destroyed so we are replanting them thanks to your money so yes in the short term it's a good thing but in the middle term you should think think about um, well, the question of taking plane. And it's a hard question. Very hard question. Um, I was wondering, we, um, Google is doing a lot with carbon neutrality, with a server, uh, but uh, do you have ideas of what you would expect from Google to do in France on this topic? On, uh, in terms of... Uh, to help uh, sorting the climate change issue. Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, the city of Paris uh, will be expanded uh, in 10 years with the Grand Paris. And this will imply the development of enormous data centers. And Google will be uh, the biggest uh, investor in this thing. And I think, therefore, that Google has um, a kind of uh, influence on the public decisions, most notably on the public decisions to invest in solar panels, uh, windmills, etc., to fuel these data centers. And I think Google should use its influence, political influence, and do advocacy in France to, uh, to enhance the development of renewables. And it did so uh, in, uh, in California, so it's possible. Um, thanks a lot for the talk. I really like the intro to the art on um, human influence on natural disasters. And I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on that. Like how, can, how does human consumption influence hurricane intensity but not frequency? Oh, well, uh, these are complicated physics, to be honest. Um, these are the results of the IPCC. And if you're interested in the um, um, the developments about this, I, I suggest that you read the summary for policymakers of the last IPCC report. We can talk about this after the, the conference. I, I can give you references. It's very interesting in terms of climate science. And basically, uh, it, it just shows that the intensity and the frequency of extreme events, would it be rain, would it be floods, would it be hurricanes, is totally different. Yes, they're not connected. They're not connected. They're not connected. But climate science, you know, it's it's as complicated as uh, meteorology. It's uh, enormous computers to calculate this. It's, uh, we cannot understand this intuitively. Like it's uh, very hard. Why am I saying this? Because um, since my uh, nephew was born, I've completely changed the way I consume. I don't take airplane anymore and so on and so forth. When I explain this around me, most people will tell me, well, you do that for yourself, fine. I won't do that for myself because I don't see I'm part of the solution. Because people will tell me the solution should come from politicians. And then there is this ambiguity between where should we take action? Should we take action at individual level or should we take action at political level? And at some point, people will say, I won't do anything until politicians do something. Meaning that you need to vote for the right people. Uh, what's your take on this? It's a tricky uh, question. To be honest, I have for a very long time believed that in changing my uh, personal behavior, uh, I could convince people around me to change their behavior. And it will, you know, with uh, several steps, convince everybody. It's not the case. It's not the case because many people cannot get convinced with this because changing your behaviors and most notably changing the fact that you take or don't take the plane is enor it's an enormous change in life. That's why I believe more and more in the, in the political, um, the political um, issue. And I think it's maybe the only solution. But thanks to the Paris Agreement and thanks to this kind of international treaties and protocols, now NGOs can sue states, uh, you know, to ask them to respect their engagement. The uh, Urgenda uh, affair in Netherlands, uh, now the Affaire du siècle in France, I don't know if some, some of you signed this, but this is the very beginning of a new era in which the NGOs have the tools to attack states' injustice. So I believe in this, and I also believe um, 
in uh, you know all these demonstrations we see with the Extin uh, Extinction Rebellion, which was very active in Ireland, in England, and they managed to have their uh, parliament declare a climate emergency. I don't know if you uh, know that. Um, so now, if the parliaments declare this everywhere in the world, and it's possible, at least it's possible in, the, in Europe at the beginning, I hope that there will be uh, political action. But we are star starting to have the tools to do this at the national level. Mm, and this is linked to these, uh, the, the international treaties. Two, two decades ago, it was not possible. And just didn't have this, you know, this big treaty saying, OK, France has to reduce its emission by this amount. So, mm. Do you believe there will be ecologism terrorism at some point? Oh, yes, well, it's already happening. Yes, Extinction Rebellion will start to do this, but maybe in six months, maybe in two years, but I, I'm sure, yes, they will start, there will be a, a kind of uh, ecological terrorism. Mm. Even if nonviolence is the first uh, tool uh, until now, they really try to, you know, to turn off the lights uh, of the signs uh, in the streets. Uh, they try to uh, to paint in black the Société Générale uh, uh, vitrines in La Défense, and they do very symbolic actions uh, like that. Um, but until now, it's non-violent. So. Uh, I'm unemployed. <laughs> um, no, I just finished my studies uh, 24 hours ago, so I have to think a bit about what I'm, what I will do. To be honest. Thank you for the talk and the presentation. Apart from reducing our flight consumption, what advice can you give each of us? What's in our hands to do? You know, what's the biggest step we could take, or smaller steps that would help uh, us believe that we have, we are having an action, mm -hmm. a positive action. The first action, and it's maybe less satisfying than doing physical things, is to be aware of this and continue to read things about it, update your knowledge about the way your daily life consumption. For example, buying this kind of thing, okay, it's something like 200 kilograms of carbon dioxide for a computer, but there are many other problems. To extract the material for this, it's almost, in my memory, like eight, uh, 800 kilograms of primary matter that is e extracted in China, in very, most often in China. Um, in, and it's extracted in very poor environmental uh, regulations. So it has also biodiversity impact locally in other countries. And each time you buy these kind of things, there's not only climate impact, there's also pollu pollution, health impact locally. So it's the first thing, be aware that each time you buy something, there's an iceberg of consequences you just don't see at all. It's the third thing. And then, um, for me, the three main things, OK, don't take the plane. But I know it's, it's, in, it's really hard not taking the plane. And I love like traveling everywhere, but it's, it's uh, very difficult. The second thing is um, to be in a house that um, is well insulated. It's very hard for, for poor people, uh, this thing, because it's very expensive just to insulate. And, but there's more and more administrative helps and incentives to help you doing this. It's an enormous reduction of carbon dioxide, just living in a home that is well insulated. And the third step is um, to uh, reduce the consumption of meat. It seems very um, um, anecdotic, but it's not at all. It's an enormous share of our emissions. Um, to give you an example, uh, if you, um, well, no, it's, it's too complicated, but yeah, just uh, go vegetarian, it's uh, an enormous uh, thing. Then, uh, if you think about, um, for example, the personal mobility, forget the electric car, forget it. It's a total uh, um, liar, yeah. What? Disaster, yeah. Uh, it's the same question as for computers. We have the feeling that because the electricity in, fr in France is from nuclear source and uh, because um, it's cool to have a Tesla in Paris, to be honest. But in fact, uh, the, again, the iceberg of consequences is 
absolutely enormous because of material extraction, uh, lithium, cobalt, um, tantal, all the rare earth. All these require enormous amounts of energy to be extracted and, um, and yeah, it's not ecological, unfortunately. Mm. Even if they're really beautiful. But, uh. Wouldn't it be interesting to have um, the carbon footprint for each item? Uh, five, for example, such uh, I'm, I'm eleven. You know, before I would be very glad to have it. Mm. Or just things I buy. Yeah, it's uh, it's um, well, administrations have this idea since um, quite a long time ago, like maybe 1990, just after the Rio conference. People had this idea of uh, like a barcode, taking into account the carbon uh, emissions. The problem is that it's considered to be very complicated. Because in Europe, we could do this. The problem is that in this thing, you've, you have all the Mendeleev table of elements, all coming from different countries with producers and, and so many screen companies between the producer and uh, the, the company that does the combination of all the elements. So it's incredibly complicated, in fact, to have a clear assessment of uh, the carbon uh, content of each goods. But in theory, yes, it would be it would be the best thing, but we don't know how to do it yet. In terms of logistics, it's very complicated. Uh, question regarding the, also the gilets jaunes movement. In yeah. France, do you think there is an uh, inherent uh, you know, opposition between um, an ecological uh, change of system and uh, the social side of that? Well. Uh, in fact, no, there's no real opposition, but it's my personal opinion again. Um, I think there's, to the contrary, there's a big convergence because the economic model we are currently in creates enormous inequalities, raise the global, so we don't have real poverty anymore or much less than before, yet it raises inequalities. And at the same time, it totally destroys the environment. And more and more um, movements are in fact coupling the Gilets Jaunes and um, the ecologist uh, movements. To give you an example, at the last COP, uh, COP24 in Katowice, um, countries decided to sign the so-called Silesia Declaration on just transition. It's just to show you that states do not consider this as separate problems anymore. The social issue and the environmental issue, ecological issue, we already had this, uh, you know, this uh, merging of, um, of uh, problems with the idea of um, sustainable development. You know, you have economic, social, environmental. We always had this uh, idea. And the concept of, uh, develop of sustainable development was born in 1987. So, you know, since 30 years, we are talking about this coupling of social and environmental issues. Yet in the Gilets Jaunes, I guess that you asked the question because this movement was born after the carbon tax raise. My answer to this is just that the carbon tax was ill-managed and most of all ill-explained, uh, not explained well. Because in fact, the carbon tax exists since uh, 2014, uh, I think, and it raised progressively. The reason why the Gilets Jaunes got it in the street, it's because the international price of oil just ra raised up. And they saw at this time that, oh, there is a big share of, uh, of carbon tax in the price. But the, the recent rise of fuel, uh, fuel prices was not linked to the carbon tax. But if we are, if, if we are of the opinion that the politicians should solve this, uh or are a big part of the solution uh, for this, then they need to act um, within the market economy, either either with raising taxes or forbidding things. Uh, so the, the price of petrol, for example, should continue to rise if you want to mitigate mm. petrol. Yes, damage. yes, but then you have to think that when you rise the price of the fuel, the state got more money, and then you can reduce redistribute it. And it, currently, it's not the case. The money that is raised through the carbon tax is spent in the global public budget. And to make people more um, um, accept this tax carbon, the money raised by the tax carbon should be redistributed to poor, uh, you know, poor uh, households 
who just don't have the choice to uh, take the car and uh, go to work by car. And then we wouldn't have this problem. We would give them money, the money of the carbon tax. And you still have, you would still have this incentive effect uh, of uh, carbon pricing. It's just that it was not well designed, to be honest. Thanks a lot. It was a really interesting. We gave us a lot of advice on how to reduce uh, or individual consumption of uh, energy. And uh, on the other hand, we see like the, the global uh, population rising. Uh, what about the cost, the uh, environmental cost of uh, having children? Is it something that you, of uh, having children? Children? Children, sorry. Is it something that you simulate also with uh, the IPCC? Um, well, the, the question of, of demography, right? Yeah, uh, it's a very uh, tricky uh, question because there's, you know, a question of ethics in this. It's not only about uh, climate or other thing. No, we do not talk about it, except in side events, which are uh, little conferences, public conferences, aside climate negotiations, but within the negotiations, state never talk about demography. Of course, China, uh, we often have the feeling that there's a big problem here, but don't forget that the demographic question um, is important, but we often use this question to say, okay, it's not our problem. You know, China, it's more than 1 billion people. It's not us, come on, we are 70 million in France and 500 million in Europe. Yes, but because of our emission, carbon emission profiles, in fact, each of us represents like five or seven uh, people in other regions of the world. In Africa, people emit less than one ton of carbon dioxide per year which is 13 less than us. So even if the population of Africa uh, reaches uh, 1.5 or 3 billion, it will, we will still emit more than them. So yeah, it's important to, to use figures when you consider the question of demography because uh, politicians often use it to, you know, skip the question. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.